I could have picked any job. I could have, you know, I'm here on Earth one time. I could have picked any job on planet Earth that I wanted to do. Yeah. I wanted to do the one that I absolutely loved, doing the actual work. Yeah. Not not for some reward, not because it's going to take me to some show or to some other benefit, because I wanted to fucking love every day that I sat down. And and look, there are plenty of days that are not like I'm, I'm not claiming that it's like, you know, I'm in guru mode sitting in my computer and it's just perfect yeah. every single day. <laughs> There's still I, work oh days. My God, yeah. No, there it's still work and it's still frustrating when it's not going well and writer's block is a thing. And look, there's a there's a million reasons why it's tough. But the truth is, is I absolutely love it at its core. It's just experiment. I never know what's going to happen. I sit down at the computer. I start playing with a sample pack or some sound I had from last week that I started that wasn't finished and I just start playing with it and experimenting and I really do my best to keep my critical listening self out of the picture. Fetish, welcome to the Underground Society podcast, man. What's up, man? How are you? Good. Great, Thanks for having yeah. me. I appreciate it. First, I just got to say, I love your hair. I love oh, your branding. You. <laughs> and I can't wait to talk to you about that today. But man, is it does it ever get awkward for you, like going to the grocery store or, or anything, looking at the hair and people like looking over at you? That guy has pink hair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not so much. It's, it's an easy recognizer, which is kind of nice. True, you know, true. I have fans coming up and people at shows like, oh, I saw the hair and had to come say what's up. So that it's easy to pick out of a crowd, which is which is fun. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Not only the hair, but also I think you have one of the greatest stink faces in all of EDM. You oh love getting into the personality and you have so <laughs> much energy performing. Kind of where does that come from? Is that naturally just who you are? Was there ever like like a time where you kind of trans transition into that and you started kind of stepping more into who you naturally are? Or what, what is the story behind that? Yeah, I mean, so it's always been me that that base face that, you know, sort of weird, like crazy arm dance that's just yeah. like <laughs> kind of losing it on the dance floor and stuff. That's always been me at shows, you know, before I was ever you know, I started producing when I was like 14 or 15. So I've been a producer for, you know, since I was pretty young. But even before that, going to concerts, going to shows, I was always that maniac on the mm -hmm. dance floor with the bass face and just like feeling every single sound and just really, really into it. So it was definitely natural from from the early days in terms of uh, how I dance and how I, I was, at, you know, acting at shows. There was definitely a moment, though, you know, when I think you know, at least early in the project, I kind of had this intuition of like, or this feeling of how do I, you know, what, what is this going to be? Like, I think mm -hmm. there's that, that artist process that a lot of artists go through when they start their project or they start, especially in the world we're in with social media. Like, how do we, how do we want to present and, and, and package the project? How do we want it to feel when people are seeing and feeling it? And the more, the longer it's gone and the more I learn about myself and the project, what I really want fetish to be, you know, it, it, the answer has become more and more clear over time, which is just as authentic as me, as real as possible. And that only meant reverting to what I always Already, was, yeah. <laughs> which was just this guy who was just this maniac and had this crazy bass face on the dance floor and my, you know, standing at my desk going insane, listening to sounds. Yeah. And I, I always knew I was reacting to sounds in that way. So it's really just been kind of this revisiting to, you know, what I was always doing as a teenager. And that's been the most authentic real thing for me and for fetish, you know, dude, I re I relate with that so much. I feel like just, I know I don't have an artist project, but with this podcast project, I, yeah. I've really like at first I was almost, there was a lot of that. I didn't even re recognize it or realize it at first, but there was a lot of parts of me that I didn't want the world to know. I got made fun of in high school and there was a lot of bullying that I had to kind of overcome in, into my adult years. And yeah. I, I, once I started doing this podcast, not only did it become, make me a better communicator, I can talk about, you know, certain topics a lot easier, right? but it also just allowed me to step into myself and own who I truly am and not care what people think of me. Right. And it's kind of right. funny even just experimenting on like my own like personal social media accounts and stuff that's unrelated to the podcast, just like, like watching NASCAR. It's so random for someone who's into EDM to be a huge fan of NASCAR and, right. you know, bringing up, uh, I bring, talk a lot about like my faith with God and, you know, talk, talking about just topics that are, I grew up and that's who I naturally am. I was always afraid to like bring up those topics right. and right. Yeah. I just, I, if I relate with that so much just because it, it feels better for one. And I think it, it's almost, I've said this in the past, but almost you are the brand. Like whoever you naturally are should be the brand you put in front right. of everyone and how, how you package that. So I guess my next right. question is, how did you learn how to package all those different pieces of yourself and, right. into well, what the fetish brand is? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think there's a few things to say what you just said that make a yeah. lot of sense to me. It's just that one is that's just the moment in time we're in. Like I think a lot of people right. relate to, a lot of artists relate to that feeling you're describing because 
we're sort of in this vehicle of social media. We're in social media. We're in this place where, you know, and we grew up with that. I'm not sure how old you are. I'm 30. So, you know, coming, coming online okay, with yeah. social media world feels it's sort of like we've, you know, we've had this presentation of ourself online in this totally other dimension that has felt unnatural in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And it feels like what part should we present? I'm seeing, you know, it, it's, it just is part of the moment we're in. So that's a struggle that I think a lot of people are going, not just artists and it, yeah, people in every creative yeah. field, but really everyone is going through. So that's the first thing. And and the second thing is it's interesting. It's interesting. You said that it's random that you like NASCAR. And it's like, I think this is, again, this is the sort of, we have to dispel this notion that like everyone is just one thing. Yeah. People are so multifaceted and a lot of the mistake, or I think a mistake that I see artists and especially dance music people and DJs and stuff doing is like, they're just like, I'm just a DJ. That's all I do. It's like, yeah. me at the show and I'm just a DJ and everything is music. And it's like, there's no human on earth that operates in that way. Everyone yep. is multifaceted. They have different interests. They have different things they care about. So I think it's great that you're presenting that and talking about those things. I think that's how you actually get more authentic and more real deep mm-hmm. connection with people who are paying attention to what you're doing because no one is into just one thing, you know? So right. I've been, it, right. since the start of my project, I've tried to talk about the fact that, you know, I grew up like this surfer kid. I love to surf in like this little beach, Southern California kid. I absolutely love anime. I'm a huge I grew up lake surfing, you. so a little different. I, I grew that. up on lakes, but. <laughs> I love that. No, look, the water, <laughs> water sports are up my alley. I just, I yes. always love, love the water, love to surf. And, um, you know, I'm a huge anime nerd. I always tell myself, similar mm-hmm. to what you described, you know, it had, you know, bullying in school. I felt like saw myself as an outsider into nerdy on the fringes sort of shit. Stuff like anime is absolutely huge to me. So I, I really relate with what you're talking about. And I think that is those pieces of lore and those little nuggets about who you are and, and yourself are the pieces that will grab on to other fans yep. and other followers because they know you're a real person. And, yep. and as we're moving into a place where hopefully more and more artists and more and more people are being authentic online, more like their true selves and not like some digital version, you know, Right, right. I think that's going to be, that seems like the road to building a real community, building real people who fuck with what you're doing. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't agree more. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, I saw a post that you you posted about, I think it was your Spotify wrap to this past year, and the growth that you've seen from 2020 to now, or just over the last, you know, four years, you went from half, yeah. half a million uh, streams to what, 20, over 20 million streams now. Yeah. But something that you said in the caption of that, which was, how many songs can you add to the human art project? Yeah. I thought that it, it just caught my attention. I just want to know what you meant by that. Yeah. So I, um, I have this, this goal, this desire, this intuition with music that I think I said this on the podcast with Nick too, but it's, it's something that has been really been a driving force for me is that I really want to contribute a lot of songs to dance music, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I think a lot of people get caught up in like, I want, I want the best song. I want the biggest song with the most crazy metric, or I want it to be seen by the most number of people. Everyone has that, right. Yeah. And it's like, and there's nothing wrong with having music or songs or whatever your creative project is. And you have music like that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and look, it's not, it's not that it's a bad goal or a bad Mm -hmm. intuition. I'm just talking personally from my, my personal take is I, you know, I almost see like there's this line between like artist and scientists, you know, a lot of times scientists, when they make contributions to a field, I'm, you know, of course there's, there's internal ego and there's individualism, but the difference between artists and scientists a lot of times is that scientists feel like they're contributing to a bigger body of work that pushes humanity in one direction. That's how, Mm. that's how a scientist mind works. They're contributing Mm -hmm. something to this field because they want to edge the table forward towards whatever, whatever that, you know, the endeavor in science is. That's kind of what I feel. So many, there's so few famous, like really famous scientists because they're not in it for that. Yeah. Much (laughs) less individualized, typically, not always, not always. There's personalities there too. And, and, you know, that, that exists, of course, but, but I almost see myself more of that mindset than an artist mindset. Like this isn't about me. This is about dance music has done something for me in my life. It's been this integral part of who I am. How can I contribute to that field? And I want to mm. contribute as much as I can in service to that space and in, in service to that community with a ton of work. I just want like a catalog of a thousand fucking songs that are all good and people like and that they breach out in different areas. And like to me, that says so much more about, you know, the projects I really respect, the, the guys I really look up to, the Skrillexes, the Chris Lakes mm-hmm. of the world, you know, they when you look at their catalog, it goes back 20 years yeah, of just yeah. making songs. And they're all great. You know, of course, not everyone are, are those people. And, and they have songs that are not only so numerous, but are also at a quality that that 
defy you know any human expectation like they're yeah. so <laughs> freaking good it's insane but but the thing that reaches out to me is how many songs you know and such a wide variety of different yes. types of songs too yes, so i 100%. guess that's where where my, just my curiosity was led into by you saying that was i know you produce a lot of house music and that's kind of what the fetish brand kind of is at least for now yeah do you pl- do you a produce other stuff and b plan on branching out the fetish project to other subgenres within the dance music uh, culture or is it, or do you primarily want to focus on making house yeah, hundred percent. No, I look house has been like the home for the project from the beginning. I've always wanted to make house music, but the truth is I'm listening to everything and I, and mm-hmm. I'm trying to make a few different things right now. I've got, you know, some of the song, one of the songs that went viral was a song that was at hundred BPM. So I guess, you know, some people call it house music. I, I guess it's yeah. down tempo or whatever that you want to call it, but it's slower, slower BPMs of house music, you know, and I think that I'm interested in that style. I'm interested. I have a couple songs right now that I'm working on that are sort of like 128 halftime. So okay. it's not, it's, you know, it's like house BPMs, but it's sort of weird, weird speeds and not right, traditional right, right. house, house music. So I think there's like, you're you talking know, about house just being on that, yeah. the, another subgenre of house that a lot of people is not very popular anymore, but it did have its time with, is like speed house is another right. like kind of weird BPM, but it's still technically house. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's still, you know, four, four kicks on the quarters yeah. and it's, you yeah. know, it's, so I'm, I'm making some stuff like that. I've made some lo-fi music that I really like that is just kind of nice. I really to fuck change. with lo-fi. Yeah. It's I like awesome. lo-fi. yeah. Change the brain power around, you know, and start working on something else. So I'm definitely working on some other things. I think fetish in terms of releasing, I definitely want to start putting out some other genres and, you know, to me, what I want to do with the project, who I am as an artist branches beyond some line in the sand of what mm-hmm. you consider a genre to be. So I, I, I hope that, that's what I'm able to write and put out, you know, that's super cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. I love, I love your approach with, with your music and just your idea and the person who, who, who is behind the brand that, that I'm getting down and sitting down and talking with right now. Yeah. A little a piece of your, your past that I want to bring up and how, how we got connected was through Nick Truink. Shout out to him, but who used yeah. to be a professor at icon, who was your professor, right? He was. Yeah. But what was, what was your time at icon and what, where were you in your artist journey when you, you know, when you did attend and what difference did that make for your career? Um, so it, I think it definitely made a huge difference in my career. I definitely give Icon a lot of credit for helping me get off the ground and get started. Yeah. Shout out to Nick. Nick is awesome. Had a great time on his podcast and he's been a really good just mentor and creative, uh, you know, creative person bringing up other creative people, which mm-hmm. is awesome. But no, Icon, Icon was great. I met, you know, I think the biggest thing Icon really gave me was I met a great group of friends that we just worked on music every single day, not nice. just while we were at school, but we got a house together after. I've talked about it before. My buddy Sully was one of my first friends. Oh, yeah, he's been on the show. I know, Sully. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's yeah. amazing. He's, he's awesome. And he's, so you were you know, homies with him, G-Rex, like those boys. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, the, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the Michigan, the Michigan squad yeah, yeah. out there. G-Rex is awesome. Jake is amazing, and Sully's amazing. And I, I, so I lived with Sully and Matt, who's Peekaboo, and yeah. JD Effin. <laughs> And that's really, I think, gave me a huge kick in the ass to get started because I was watching all these amazing producers do amazing things. And that helped me get, you know, get me some real time and, and some mentorship, you know, underway early on. Right. So I was I was pretty early. I mean, I started producing when I was like 14. So I've been messing around with logic and and different DAWs and stuff since I was a kid, but always pretty unseriously, pretty bad. And you know, just never was was really digging in at it, but always had an interest. And then it wasn't until I went to school and met that group of friends that I really started diving in. So that were you been, originally yeah. producing music similar to theirs? Because they all kind of have this like the experimental bass kind of whoopy type experimental trap sound to their music. Yeah. Were you kind of producing that early on? Or it's so interesting how you yeah. were with those guys and your music is just completely different. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. I was kind of the odd man out in the house, honestly. I mean, That's it's cool. like you walk down the hallway. It was so fun. You'd walk down the hallway, you have like four doors going down the hall and just like different sub bases, you know, <laughs> pumping through each pile. So then you get the, you know, I was basically the house head in the yeah, house, yeah. Um, you know, making some different stuff and making house music. So it's, it definitely influenced me for sure, like workflow stuff and learning tricks from those guys. I mean, yeah, helped me so, yeah. so immensely. So I give them a huge amount of credit for for helping me get off the ground and get running. But it's funny to see how it has bled into, you know, my sound and that those sounds influence yeah, the house music yeah. that I make and stuff. So and vice versa, even some yeah. of their they make houseier tracks, too. That Yeah. Yeah. What, what would you say going back to the icon days? Did you really, what was like the main benefit for you? Because I know it's sometimes different for everyone, whether it's learning how to produce yeah. or learning, you know, the business side a little better, or like you said, the relationships, what, what, I guess, 
lessons or things that you learned that have really stuck with you and that you, you utilize in today's, you know, in your, your career now? Yeah. I mean, I, for me, I would say it's the relationships hands down, you know, that just, just learning to be with and around other creatives, you know, we're honing your craft and diving in at something is just such an important part of. That's the part I'm excited for. Yeah. I I mean, I think that's, (laughs) that's really what it takes. Like I, it's hard to be, you know, I just don't see anyone as a one man show. You need outside influence. It takes a village to build not only a project, but to get your own creative intuition sort of like lining up and anyone, you know, I'm not saying there's people and and artists and amazing producers who don't just do it themselves and sitting in a room behind a desk and making that happen. I'm doing that, you know, pretty much every day, but at least initially it really meant so much to get some really great friends who help push you, help teach you, you experiment with different types of music like that opening up of working with other people is something I've always wanted for myself and for fetish. I love collaborating, want to collaborate with as many people as possible. Just yeah, working be, with people is fun, man. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's fun to do. Yeah. It's just fun. Uh, it, it just before you talk about any business or benefit yeah. or any of that, it's just fun. So yeah. would you want to be sitting there you know, by yourself staring at a computer screen or would you rather have someone in the room yeah. hanging out with you, giving you ideas? Like it just sounds, yeah. Yeah, sounds and, I, and I enjoy learning. You know, I always enjoy learning. Yeah. So learning yeah. from people is just a blast to me. And I, I think that's been the most, um, the biggest benefit from yeah. going. Yeah. What going from, I brought up a second ago, going from the last four years, going from about half a million streams to over 20 million. Right. What do you think played into that? Do you think it was anything from icon that you, you, you know, played into that? Was it anything that it was, it just kind of randomly happened or what, what was really, did you have a game plan to get there? What, what, what was that like for you? I mean, I definitely had a strategy coming out of the gate for what I wanted to do with Fetish. So that helped a lot. You know, I didn't just like finish the song and put it out and just sort of like run with it. I had I had a I had a concept for what I wanted to do in the beginning and I had it well planned out. I got, you know, it, I sort of attacked the project from different angles, even from the initial right. stages. I was like, OK, music first. I got to have the music that I want that feels different and unique. The brand's got to feel unique and different and, and feel a certain way. I've got the name and the 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 imagery that is that is pushing me i've got a catalog of music ready and and spent a lot of time getting work done so that i buy myself time before i release so i tried to cover a lot of bases initially and fetish is my first project and i've been extremely extremely lucky to have it go the way that it's gone i don't contribute anything in terms of the streaming growth or or the numbers to really anything specific at icon i think i learned to build a project there and that mm. was that was awesome so that i'm sure i'm yeah, sure you, did contribute you you, you you got this tools to put in your toolbox and then with this with the release or with the growth of the streaming numbers and everything you just basically use those tools for your advantage yeah what 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 would you say some of those tools are yeah i mean so being able to you know switch in and out of different mindsets is really important Mm -hmm. you know having having a sense of self-awareness and self-recognition of what your music sounds like where it goes and some more critical ears i think really does does a lot and being able to switch into you know, out of artist mode where I, I'm getting into a state of flow in my computer and I'm just working and experimenting and it's fun and abstract and creative and being able to step back with a critical ear and say, OK, how is how are people reacting to this? How am I reacting to this? What is it? Where does it fit or how does it sit? Like being able to go switch in and out of logic and creative mode is, is a valuable skill set for sure. So I'd say that's an important tool. And, you know, I think just the tool of sharing music with other people, you get, you sort of, you gain a confidence and an ability to share stuff without yeah. taking things personally. And so many right. projects never get off the ground because they, they have some fear or, you know, there's some sort of fear of like, oh, are people going to like it? How am I going to feel about it? Like, what if they hate it? And it's like, you yeah, have, I as suck. An artist, why even do this in the first place? Type yeah. Thing. You yeah. have to let go of all of that. That, that has to be thrown absolutely, you know, to, to the wayside because otherwise you'll never do anything. You're, you're going to be trapped yeah. by your own fear and your own, um, you know, your own anxiety about, about what sounds good or what way you should go when, when reality, you got to trust your gut as an yeah. artist and just start. start and even, with, if, even if you know. you're trying shit, it's the wrong shit. At least you're finding out that it is wrong. Of course. Like, that's just points, as valuable. At least points you in the direction of the that's, right way to that's go. That's just as valuable, if not yeah. more so. If you take a step in the wrong direction, it tells you a lot about yeah. not going in that direction. Yeah. About <laughs> something that didn't, that didn't work. You either didn't like it. It wasn't fun to make. Someone else didn't respond to it. You have a knack for this other thing. So the lessons where you fail or the lessons where you where you pick something up that didn't go right is equally or more so valuable than the ones that do, right. because it shows you, you know, what what not to do or what way you can guide your next move. You know? Right. How, how much of your writing do you because to me, it doesn't seem like it seems like you're which is the right thing to do, in my opinion, really just letting your your 
natural flow state come come into play and naturally you sit down and just it seems like you have a, a really fun time producing and doing what you do yeah how much of because I, I see a lot of other artists like go for what's hot what's you know very they some some artists more than others lean on like a little bit more formulaic than than others and it seems like you're kind of the opposite of that so I right. guess my question is how much of that comes into play to if you've had huge songs like come check this what I want to talk about in a second but writing yeah. a song like that how much of taking what you think will do well compared to everyone else versus just authentically doing what you truly feel like you should be doing um yeah. in writing that song like where do you where do you kind of stand in all that yeah i mean for me there's just no question the the experiment mode and the authenticity is absolutely essential for what i do i absolutely love the point you made and i take it as it's it's a really amazing point which is i have fun when i'm doing it right that's <laughs> that is the whole thing if i wasn't going to have fun when I was doing it, if I wasn't going to feel it and That's get your that whole persona going, to begin with. So well, well, it's like, yeah. I, I could have picked any job. I could have, right. you know, I'm here on <laughs> yeah. earth one time. I could have picked any job on planet earth that I wanted to do. Yeah. I wanted to do the one that I absolutely loved doing the actual work, yeah. not, not for some reward, not because it's going to take me to some show or to some other benefit because I wanted to fucking love every day that I sat down and, and look, there are plenty of days that are not like, I'm, I'm not claiming that it's like, you know, I'm in guru mode sitting in my computer and it's just perfect yeah. every single day. <laughs> There's still I, work oh my days. God. Yeah. No, there it's still work and it's yeah. still frustrating when it's not going well and writer's block is a thing. And look, there's a, there's a million reasons why it's tough, but the truth is, is I absolutely love it at its core. And for the reasons you just said, it's just experiment mode. I never know what's going to happen. I sit down at the computer, I start playing with a sample pack or some sound I had from last week that I started that wasn't finished. And I just start playing with it and experimenting. And I really do my best to keep my critical listening self out of the picture. And I'm just how, what does this feel like? Can I follow the road and get into that state of flow of experimentation and fun? And then that's, you know, those videos I've been posting, which is me at my desk. Yeah. Producing it's like, <laughs> that's just me <laughs> literally in the minute that I made something. I'm like, oh shit, I got to film this. This is so safe. Like, I fucking love this. Crank up the volume, you know, and I'm loving this. And that, that mode of being in a Which fun, I feel like those videos place. too come yeah. across, a, like I see, a, we all see a lot of people do that in our industry and or, and whatever subgenre you want to you want to talk about but yeah i feel like sometimes it look like it comes across forced like the artist doesn't right isn't really into it but when you do it yeah. you're like no i'm actually feeling this i'm actually like having a good time like it's, so it comes across authentic too it's you know it people are really good lie detectors and fake yeah. detectors <laughs> you know that we're just we're built to do that inherently so i hope mine don't feel forced for me it's literally making picking up the camera just being like Oh my God, I'm loving what I'm doing. How do I turn up the volume mm -hmm. and start filming this right now? Cause I'm in, I'm having this moment of like, I really love this thing. And I feel and, like part of that, it's like, it's yeah. not super over edited either. It's not like, right. Yeah. That's yeah, a well, I, mean, and I, that I had to learn too, even just with this podcast. I, I went through a period of time where I like over edited and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> right. It's just a learning process right. to, for some people, but yeah, it's also the yeah. time, this assemble of the times, like things are moving that way where the DIY stuff is, is also going off because there is an, there's not people crave yeah. authenticity and connection and people can feel when it's real. So I appreciate you saying that. I really hope that mine feel that way. I mean, there are plenty of artists who are doing it and you can tell that it's doctor. You can tell that they're just really like putting in an effort to make it look like that way, but it's not them. The other part of that is that, you know, once you're going to shows and in the scene a little longer, you start meeting these people in real life and you like, then it's really obvious. Yeah. Then it's yeah. very painfully, blatantly obvious when you're with someone live or at the shows and they're one way and then on camera and, and, and everything else they're doing, yeah. they're another way. That is so hard, you know, to, for me, that's so hard to digest. And I, I make it a point to be the same me in every place that I can. Me there's sitting few, at my computer there's, there's, is... It's so funny, you know, as you said, there's a couple people in specific, I will not say names, but... Of course, That yeah. like popped in my head, I was like, oh yeah, it's a good... Yeah, yeah, you... Yep. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, of course, I'll never <laughs> shout anyone out. Everyone's got their own reasons for doing things. I'm not I'm not hating on anyone who has their own process for how they go about doing it. It for is me, real, though. <laughs> it's it's definitely real. And, and, and for me, the authenticity is absolutely essential for what I want from Fetish to be. It's one of the core tenets of Fetish is to bring up other creatives, other people who are doing shit... Because because they love it and it's who they are really. So I try to be that same me in front of the camera, my computer, whether I'm posting on social media, mm -hmm. who I am at the shows, it's not, you know, it's it's all one person, it's all the real me as much as possible. And you take then you take out any risk of ever having that feeling of someone thinking that you're not being authentic because it's just you. Right. You're just being you just across you, yeah. the board and and you know, admittedly, that was not always what I did in the first start of the project project. It didn't feel that way. And the more I've learned and the more I've, I think I've tried to grow into that, that artist who just wants to be as authentic 
and as me as possible, the more success I'm finding and connecting with people who really care, you know, Be, being um, that authentic, you too, obviously goofy, fun, loving personality. When those we brought up kind of some days it does feel like a job. Sometimes it is hard, obviously. Yeah. How do you continue to still be in that goofy play mode when it is hard and stressful? Yeah, I mean, so there's a then there's another part of this, which I think is not talked about anywhere near enough in music places, especially, which is because everything is so like productivity. You got to do this 100% yeah. <laughs> of the time. Go, go, go. If you're not, st- I mean, there's still a stigma. If, like if you're not like that, or if you even say you're not like that, you know, it's going to be a problem. And the truth is, is I think the answer to your question comes from just this place of underlying gratitude. It's like I am in a position where I get to sit here every day and work on something that I love. And there are days when that doesn't go well, but it's still a day I got to it's do still that. still better than... Crunching numbers. Yeah, (laughs) of course. It's a day I got to be right here doing something creative, attempting to make sense of some amazing creative abstract idea and put it into the world for people. I have, you know, amazing friends and family and a house that's safe and good mental health and physical health. Like there's so much in my life. So it sounds like gratitude you know, is really the, it's, it's, the key it's to gratitude. Yeah. For, for the hard days, it's the realization. It's being able to t- take a step back from yourself and say, this moment I'm having a writer's block or this thing that I'm not able to create today or for whatever reason, I've got my mind on this other part of my life or whatever the thing is that's stopping you in that moment. It's, it's taking a step back, having the awareness, the realization. I'm a, I'm a, I've been practicing meditation for years and it's, mm. you know, that's been a huge element of my gratitude practice in my life now. And having that ability to step back and say, wait, you know, this is not the end of the world. This is one day where things feel yeah, this way. It's just a frustrating day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a frustrating day. And and also there's a cyclic nature to things. I think as an artist, you've got to be in tune with that. And there are days yeah. when you're at the bottom of that trough and it's not going well and your creative juice is empty and whatever, for, for whatever the reasons, it almost doesn't even matter. You're at the bottom of that. And the knowledge and the awareness that that's going to start curving back like this and come back around and you mm-hmm. will have your moment in the sun again where everything is flowing gives you the presence of mind to say, you know, it's okay. It's okay that it's not the best day in the studio, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I think for me too, talking talking about that arc and that the dip, because even I feel that like, I think one of the things that I've learned to, it's not always like a, a, a end all be all, but I think really giving yourself time off to just do other shit is a big thing for me to get, to, to have the uptick again. To feel inspired again, to feel like I'm ready to work again, to feel like that's taking a break is, I think, a, a big way to get through that. A thousand percent. I mean, that's the again, this goes back to the stigma point. It's like I would again, people if people think you have to say you're doing this 100 percent of the time, all the time or something's wrong and you're not going to yeah. make it. This is just a completely insane take and point of view. I'm not, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm working harder than anyone I know to make this happen. I'm putting still every single day at my desk doing this. It's to say nothing. I'm not, it's not that I'm not working hard, right. I'm not doing everything I can, but all of that comes with a giant caveat, which is that you're also a human being. You're a whole total human being with physical health that, that demands some attention and yeah. family and friends that demand attention and time. We all have limited time and, and learning how to use your time as effectively and, and, you know, just, just taking again, that step back and saying, it's not all about being productive. It isn't all about music and productivity. You're an entire whole complete human being who's just doing music because you love it or whatever the creative, whatever your creative thing is, you know, attack that thing, go at it with full ferocity with the caveat and the realization that nothing comes before. I mean, for me, the truth is nothing comes before my friends, my family, the people I love. If there's, if there's ever having good, having our priorities in a good spot too. And that looks different for everyone, but having your priorities where you want them and not making excuses or wishing things were different, like actually prioritizing the things that are important to you. (laughs) Yeah. And it's again, you're exactly right. Everyone's different. You've got, everyone's got their own list of priorities and where those things line up for me, nothing becomes for before the people I care about in my life. You know, if I've, if it, there are some moments when it's inevitable, if there's a show and, and someone's thing on the same day. And it's like, there are some moments when, and you've got to, yeah, wait, you got to be able to weigh those <laughs> yeah. options. It's like, I, I, there's nothing I can do in this moment. I, but, but when it's at all possible, nothing comes before those people I'll, I'll sacrifice, you know, it, it, it's funny because they've done studies where they ask people at the end of their life, you know, they say, what, what did you really care about? What was the thing or what, what would you have changed? You know, if you could go back and do the answer is never, God, if only I'd worked 
at my yeah. career this much harder every day. If only I took all those shows instead of seeing my friends on their birthday. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's never been the fucking answer one time. Yeah. It's always the opposite. It's always the inverse. I just wish I had as many minutes with my family and my friends and people I care about as possible. So I try to never make that trade when it's at all, you know, doable. Right. And it's not to say that there's not those moments. There's a sacrifice to be made for, for working hard and driving and achieving your goals. It happens, but yeah, and it's having, it's necessary to to a certain degree, but of course, yeah, of course. yeah, yeah. Talking about taking time off and having fun, I saw you went yeah. to Thailand not too long ago. Yeah, how was yeah, that? It was amazing. <laughs> it was it was so much fun. Again, it was just one of these trips. Like I had some of my you know old lifelong friends that wanted to go, so we did a trip together, and we cool. did two or three weeks where, of course, I Dude, used it. Going for, to Thailand is like yeah. actually shockingly affordable. Oh, it's amazing. Can, yeah. It's amazing. It's affordable. It's an unbelievable part of the world. The people are amazing. The food alone. I, just yeah, the food. I love, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I ate everything, everything across the country. It was just eating, eating, eating. It's so nice. Good. It's so good. Nice. Yeah. What was your favorite part of Thailand? Um, what's my favorite part? The food is definitely high on the list. I'm a big, like I said, I'm a big water guy. So we got to do some snorkeling and see the beaches and do, um, some of the islands were absolutely unbelievable. Just like swimming with like gorgeous mm -hmm. fish and, and seeing that part of the world is something I've always wanted to do. So that was, that was one of my favorite parts for sure. Very cool. Have you gone to any other places, yeah. vacation, traveling outside of Thailand? Yeah, I mean, I've I've done a few. I've been lucky to go to some really cool places. I mean, I lived in Australia as a teenager for a few months, and and oh, really cool. loved that. I've been to you know I've done Kenya and Africa for a few weeks nice. and seen some amazing yeah. animals and and parts of, of parts of Kenya, which was beautiful. I was in India. I got hired to play two shows in India at the end of last year for New Year's, and I saw parts of India. Goa and Pune, man, I'm so jealous. I've only gone to Canada. <laughs> I've see, I've never done Canada, so I'm I'm jealous of you there. I I gotta go to Canada. Canada yeah. is cool. Canada, yeah. it's kind of like the it's it's like obviously it's still like the um I'm like part of like North America, so it's like very similar. It's not like Kenya or Africa, how it's like a completely different world over there. But right, it is cool. Like some of the laws are different. Like I went with I was 18, so like legal yeah. drinking age is 18 over there. So I was able to like go out and have some beers and like it, it. it was just a cool time especially Love for the time it. of my life that i went it was cool <laughs> right yeah i think it's great traveling traveling is so yeah. just like there's something so magical about seeing a different place and different people it's totally different how you do anything and if it's you want to so... reset and step away from your work that's a great way to do it because it completely <laughs> oh, especially going somewhere 100%. that like is completely foreign to you it's like yeah you know you get to like almost teleport somewhere else and leave your old world behind it for a little bit and then come back to it you know, after. yeah, well, that's that's yeah. kind of what we were saying. Inspiration comes from the other parts of your life, the yeah. people you love, the places you go, the things you do. Like, it's very rare. Sometimes it happens where inspiration actually comes from the source thing you're doing. Yeah. You hear something and it triggers inspiration. If you're a producer or if you're in whatever creative field you're in, you know, other work can inspire you, obviously. But really, I think most of our inspiration comes from the other parts of who we are in our life. And that reset of taking taking time off to go do those other things is actually one of the best ways to recharge mm -hmm. your your creative battery, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. So it couldn't, it would not be a fetish interview if we didn't talk about one of your biggest con songs that blew up on TikTok. Come check yeah. this. Yeah. Tell me just, I'm sure your approach, we've already kind of talked about your approach to writing music and whatnot. Your approach was obviously just go in and have fun, but what was the, I guess the, the, what is, what was that experience like having that song take off? And I mean, Jessica Alba yeah. posted it at the Oscars and, um, all kinds of crazy shit. Yeah. That was just that song, this week. So. That was crazy. I, I <laughs> yeah. saw that and like lost my shit this week when I saw it. I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's been an insane, a totally insane thing. I like to say that like the thing I, the way I think about that song is it's really given my project a heartbeat. You know, that's, yeah, that's yeah. the song that's sort of given, I think a home base to fetish and, I absolutely love that. I mean, my my personal favorite thing about it is just seeing the variety and how many different creative people it's connected with because of its uses on Instagram and TikTok. It's like I've just seen every type of video on earth that people are posting and doing stuff with online use that track. And that that's the coolest part. It's not a metric. You know, it's 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 no number. It's no metric. It's just like people from every field using and, and I'm really starting to view it as that song is just a bridge to yeah. all of these amazing other creative people. That's that's really how I view it at this point. And um, that's cool. That's been a that's been my favorite part for sure of it of it going off. It's been, you know, obviously it was totally unexpected. There was just organic uses of it in the beginning that resonated mm -hmm. with certain influencers and it took off on TikTok and what was the, the you know, what was like know. the first, I guess, 
was there like a I know like there's like trends and stuff that happen on social media, especially apps like TikTok. Was yeah. there like a specific trend that it caught on to first or what was I what there was like wasn't the first a trend? Kinda, yeah, I mean, there wasn't one that that started it, but it did have its own dance. That was the first uh, trend trend. It had like, remember, there was like specific TikTok dances yeah. for different songs and it had yeah. its own dance. So I Got think it. that that was one of the early, early catalysts for getting it going. Yeah, but that world is just That's completely awesome. unknown to me. I don't, I don't know, I have no <laughs> idea what makes songs go or not go. I don't think anyone yeah. does. It's just magic. You know, it's magic. <laughs> it's, it's a stroke of the algorithm, you know, the yeah. algorithmic gods, you know. Yeah, and I'm not the opposite. I've never had luck on TikTok with anything I've done on there. So, yeah. and I feel like as a consumer, it's not a platform that I want to get sucked into. So I try yeah. and stay off of it. But yeah, I yeah. tried to use it for a while as a creator with this podcast, and it's it's hard to figure out. I think with podcasts and TikTok. For sure. Yeah, and it's just like, and you don't have to like don't don't that doesn't right, have right. to be yeah, a forcing. Yeah, that's why I was just like, eh, not for me. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's not a forcing mechanism. It's yeah. looking more and more likely that it could get banned or moved that's around. What, yeah. So yep. it's like. This it's also the thing about social media is like it's funny because it's played a big role in my project. But the truth is, is that I think it's a giant red herring. It's like put your mm -hmm. music first, get your art, get your creative project, your music, whatever it is that you're working on. Put that first and foremost. The rest will come. If you yeah. if you put that above all else, the rest is going to happen. I'm not saying marketing is important, I'm not saying there aren't ways to get good at doing content and those systems and and. You know, it's the difference between it's like I said, it's like a vehicle of the time. So if you're, mm -hmm. you know, driving a 1991 Corolla and it's got 500,000 miles <laughs> and that's what you're using to deliver your creative project to the world or you've got, you know, a new Lambo, yeah. that's yeah. those are two different modes of getting your stuff out to the world. Still so get to there, though. It, but but first and foremost, if whatever comes out of that car is shit, no one's going to yes. like it no matter what. Yes. It is. Yes. So whatever yes. you're delivering, I think, has to come first, at least for me. That's been the road. Yeah. So, yeah. What has been, I guess, outside of just connecting dots with other creative people, what have been some other, I guess, benefits of having a song like this? Did you have any pressure to, I know you, you, we were talking about earlier, you want to start, you, not start, but continue to create in different genres and stuff like that. Do you feel any pressure yeah. from a song like that doing so well? I've had, you know, I, I think I said this on Nick's podcast too. Like I've had a few days where I've been like, maybe I should try something like that song. And I just never really have fun doing it. You know, yeah. it's like every time I start. Like, I'll just be like, oh, okay, like, you know, maybe there's something about this one that's resonating. So I'll sit down and I'll, and I'll try to do something like it. And it's just never the same process. I feel like I'm forcing myself into this box, yeah. like <laughs> trying to make it. And, and there's been a few attempts where it's like, I think I made something cool with it. And it's like, and there was this moment at the end, I was like, oh, this is kind of different enough. And I do kind of like it, you know? So like, it, it, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it's like, you can't use your own, mm -hmm. like those ones that have done really well as, as building blocks to something new. I I've had that feeling a couple of times, but general as a general rule of thumb it hasn't applied a pressure to my writing to be like oh do more of that you know and and honestly i think the answer to that is if i did that it wouldn't feel authentic to me in terms of what i want to make because i'm so i'm so glad and grateful and and happy with what that song has contributed and pushing yeah and pushing the boundary forward but i want to keep doing that in all these different in places different sections you know yeah, right. and it's really hard i think to take that one thing and be like how do i shove that boundary more when that song has done sort of what it's already done yeah i don't know how much that would be contributing again it doesn't piece in with what my overall picture of making new songs and doing trying new things really does it's not to say i'll never that's, do that's it that's cool you know? that you're able to just kind of like take a step back and be like no i still want to work on other shit i'm just gonna let that song be what that song is and yeah. utilize it to you know to as you said like that kind of sets like a north star almost or i don't know how you said it but for for the fetish project it kind of has that staple feeling to it and just letting it kind of not not using it because i feel like a lot of people almost use would use something like that as like Oh, this is now like one of the biggest pieces of my brand. Now I have to almost kind of identify as this song or I have to create. Right. Yeah. You're, some people almost put their identity in something that does so well for them. And it almost seems like for you, you're like, nope, I'm still doing this other thing. I'm just going to let this song have a life of its own. And I'm okay with that song. Like, like yeah. it's still, it's still yeah. yours, but you, you do you know? Do you see what I'm saying? Hundred percent, I do. <laughs> okay, I, yeah. you know, I feel like more like that song is an extension of so, a deeper level of personality and identity behind it, which is this overall philosophy I have of why I want to contribute things to yeah. music. And yeah. that song is an offshoot of that. Again, I've made a few ideas, you know, off of like 
you know, taking like core pieces of that song and be like, what was it that made this special and trying to run with those. Yeah. So more like identifying instead of being like, oh, it's this exact sound that I have to try to emulate because right. everyone likes that sound. Right. It's much more, there's a, there's a, a background layer of my thought, which is sort of like, okay, there was, there was something that made this feel special. Maybe it's like this sexy whisper going into this big mm. deep thing. And then, you know, the cool thing I have that I'm fortunate to have happened is I had that other song trench go off. Because that yeah, yeah, has yeah. elements that are, even though the song is totally different, there's deeper pieces of the song that I think are part of the reason it did the same thing. There's this sexy whisper and it sort of goes into this like crazy, like deep thing. And it's like, you know, I think there's pieces that combine the two. And those elements, I have no problem like trying to build off right. of and using those for fetish because that identifies something core about what I've done as the fetish sound. How can I put that into other genres and other other elements? But mm -hmm. You know, in terms of a forcing mechanism, I try to, I haven't really experienced those songs as forcing mechanisms for my yeah. own writing, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I see like, uh, I, I bring up, I'll, I'll bring up someone else. Anima is a good, I think, example of this where a lot of his music has like, like, you know, when an, an Anima song comes on. Yeah. You can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. But it also has like, he uses a lot of the same, like, samples it's a lot of the same sounds or you know throughout his songs obviously they're all different songs and he does them differently but right right he has that signature sound to it do you have that for the fetish brand even though you do want to branch out other things and ha has that developed yeah. yet or do you have you or, or, or is that something that you you try and focus on at all it's it's so hard to identify being the person who's writing it. I've had people tell me that there is that feeling, like whenever mm. they're listening. And, that, and that's the thing I'm chasing. That's the thing what I really want is I want a home base that feels like, like not necessarily a sound, but just like yes. like a feeling about that song a feeling. that, I, it, that this, people can identify. This is a fetish yeah. track, you know. And, right. and I've, the the beautiful thing is I've had people reach out to me and say that I've had friends that are listening and. And some of the response has been that when they are sitting down to go through my catalog, you know, and, and those two songs, the songs that have gone viral, I really view as lightning rods to the rest of the catalog, which is part of the part of the reason I like having such an extensive catalog. It's like I get this giant body of work for people to dive into when they discover me. And I love yeah. that. I've yeah. always loved yeah. artists where I could be like, oh, my God, there's so much here. There's a whole world to explore with this artist. And I, that's what I want to have with having a ton of music. So. I, you know, I, I think that that's been the case. I, I hope that that's been the case. It is a goal of mine to have a central feeling. What is that feeling? It's, it's something that makes you feel like you're, there's, there's a hint of surprise in it. There's a hint of deep, dark and dirty and weird. You know, there's a hint of emotional connection Hence when you feel like you're fetish. just exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the name fetish. It's weird. It's a little out there. It's sort of on the fringes. Maybe it's not for everyone, but for the people that it connects with, they can really, really feel it, you know? And I'm not saying it can't be like lighter songs or other things too, but it's right. more like, you know, it's that, does it give you that sensation of freedom of expression, you know, that bass face feeling, mm -hmm. or when you're on the dance floor, does it give you that intuition that you have to start dancing and, and you're connecting with it? That's really my test for when songs are done. You know, Very if cool. I, if yeah. it's not giving me that when I'm working, then that I does. usually don't put it yeah. up. It's, yeah. it's, that's actually really cool. Yeah. Cause it's like, it's not, yeah. It, I think that's important for, for producers to have too. It's like not, a, I mean, everyone says like, Oh, create music. Do you like? And I think that's important, but really right. like you almost have like a, a true gauge. Like is, am, am I getting that feeling within myself or am I not? Yeah. And if you're not, then you're like, okay, it needs, or either needs more work. I need to move on. Yeah. And that's think, my, that's the most yeah. honest test. That's I'm telling, I mean, I'm sharing my secret sauce with as many people as I can. That is my secret sauce. It's, it's that, that I call it the stand and dance test where I close my eyes, stand up at my desk I crank the music up, I close my eyes, and I'm, I'm imagining one of the greats, someone that I love seeing, putting myself back as a 17-year-old kid at some mm -hmm. show. And if I'm listening to it and, it, and it gets me just absolutely feeling like, oh my God, there it is, and I can feel it, and the bass face comes out, and it's, and it's really connecting, that's my test for if the song is going to come out and if it's done. That's how I really truly feel if it is not has nothing to do with mix or master yeah, or right. production <laughs> technicalities or any of that. It's like, do, is it giving me that feeling there? Are, in fact, there are probably songs totally admittedly, this isn't the only way to do things. And there are songs that are out that I have out that might even be like, look, that one probably shouldn't be out. That just wasn't, mm. that song didn't sound quite right. The sounds weren't finished or but the drums the weren't right, but it gave me that feeling. 
so nice. I put it out. And yeah, that is yeah. that's my north star. It's that's not cool. it's not what are the technicalities. And I think if you listen to some of the older tracks, especially from the first year or two I was releasing, I think you could go in with a critical ear. There are yeah. artists. Well, you're who will a younger go artist in. at that point too. Your your craft isn't as honed, and you've well, had years of practice. That's true. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're always improving. You're always improving. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there are probably some you could go in. People could go in and say that one probably wasn't done enough. But the truth is, is I felt it at the time. That's how I know Perfect. that it was ready. Yeah. I felt yeah. it. So do you do you yeah. lose that feeling? for songs as you continue to play them as can you continue to hear them as like do they wear off so the funny thing is i have found with this method they're actually evergreen because it always Beautiful. is connecting me back to this to that central place yeah. that is so much deeper than like was this a sound at the time that was going off or like oh yeah that was i have like this mm -hmm. like nostalgia for this era of music it's like that's powerful too i'm not i'm not hating on that but for me those things are never powerful enough. The ones that I, I remember feeling that way when I made the song, for me, they've become evergreen. And it's again, it's not to say I play them every set or they're my new favorite. They're still right. my favorite song I ever did. Or like, I, I don't try to elevate them you know, right, to right. some place that they're not. But when I can when I can connect with that feeling, even with my own music from mm -hmm. songs that are older, that does not doesn't go that, away to me doesn't go away that that's that amazing. has not changed that's um, so cool yeah because yeah. I, I mean even as like a music fan i get that feeling i get some certain songs give me chills some you know different yeah. emotions that it that it gives me and i find that especially the songs for me especially the songs that that give me chills that hardly ever goes away so yeah yeah, yeah there that there yeah. seems to be something timeless about that connection for you know and everyone's got different tastes songs that give me that mm -hmm. feeling or you mm -hmm. the chills may not mm -hmm. connect with everyone but for whatever my taste and my intuitions and that, yeah. that unconscious cloud of, of, of interactions that's happening that gives me that feeling that that is my North star. So I, I can't recommend that enough to new producers. Like, you know, use that, use whatever your North star is in that feeling as your gauge, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, yeah. we are getting close to time, so I want to wrap up here, but sure. yeah. before we wrap up, what are you personally on, on both a, a personal, like just your personal life as well as your, the fetish project, what are you looking forward to this, this coming year? Um, it's a great question. So I'm, I'm just excited about so much. I feel like fetish is really firing on also unders right now, which is just an amazing feeling. I've got not only a ton of songs done, which has been, you know, a big goal of mine is that, like I said, that big catalog of music. So I've got a ton of music ready. I've got some shows that I'm going to announce in the coming weeks. I finally got, you know, a team and some infrastructure around the project that takes That's a few great. years to build. Yeah, so yeah. that it, it really feels like to me fetish is firing on all cylinders. And and more importantly than any of the business or or any of the details, it's just that I'm I'm loving, I'm so grateful and I'm loving every day doing it. I'm having fun writing new songs. I'm having fun sharing them with my friends and getting ready to schedule the new ones. And it's like, this is, it's really become like, my schedule and my balance, I think, has become really, really um, effective. You know, I yeah, can spend yeah. I can spend time making an idea on music. You you've know, built for, the life that you've always wanted. Yeah, I've, yeah. <laughs> I've been able. I've been I've been really fortunate and so insanely lucky, and I'm so grateful for the people that have helped me get here. But the truth is, is I'm in a place where it feels like the creative life that I wanted to have, where mm -hmm. I can focus and work on the creative project I want and still have time and and make time for all the have other parts of my life that are so yeah. valuable and that's to me that balance as mm -hmm. as a, as a home base is so important is just so valuable and important yeah. you know so. i think more people need to yeah I, even i'm going to call myself out too especially is the i'm starting to learn how to have more balance in life and you know have my priorities especially in the early days though it is hard yeah to, to get something off the ground and not work like an of insane course. person <laughs> so oh, it does no. i think it does take like the first couple of years especially or like when you're building your team or before you do that is it does look a little differently 100 but i think finding that balance for everyone is it's so so it's such an important key to being successful in in this industry there's no question <laughs> one there's an amazing quote everything in moderation even yeah. moderation yes. right? and it's yeah. just like you can't especially like you said in the early day i mean there were days i was doing 12 15 hour studio yeah. days for like the first two years that's yeah. all i fucking did and, and that, at that, that time that, too, you, you, you haven't hit burnout. You haven't experienced no. that. So you're just like, oh, I love this. I want to do this all the time. <laughs> yeah. And the, it, well, there's no burnout, you know, you, yeah. can, you, you can keep up with those hours, you know, and yeah. like, there is something to be said for like, everything else gets sacrificed for that mm -hmm. short window of time. Mm -hmm. 
everything else is sacrificed. Your health goes down. You're, you know, mm-hmm. you're eating like shit. Or hopefully not. But th- 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 I was least skipping was, meals. I was dude, not going to the gym. Uh, yeah, that was the case for me. Gym is out. I'm not seeing my friends as much. I haven't seen my family as much. My health is out the window. But I'm doing 12, 15 hours in the studio to learn how to do this. And and I think with any creative project, producer, what, whatever your field, there is something to be said for taking that ele- that piece of time, that short window, and doing that 100 percent all steam ahead. The the problem is, I think people have trouble transitioning out. And you yes, also yes, have yes. to have the self-awareness and the ability to say, oh, I've done that. I'm past that window. The rest of my life is too valuable to be making this trade mm-hmm. anymore. So so having the moments, you know, everything in moderation, even moderation. Yeah, so yeah that's I love that. I love huge. that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So last couple of questions. If there is one piece of advice you could give yourself when you decided that you wanted to make music your career, what would that yeah. be? Younger you, what would you tell them? Younger me, I would say... I would say to just trust my instinct, trust my gut with what I really wanted to do. I think don't don't listen to what anyone else says is going to be popular or big or what you think you should make. Just go with your own instinct and your own gut. I've been really lucky that I followed that at least most of the time. And that's that's been my North Star. And what's made you successful. I I hope so. Yeah. You know, I I hope so. I think there's a lot of reasons that I've had some success and and I'm really grateful for the people in my life that have helped me get here because it's no person does it alone. And yeah. it's at the end of the day, ultimately how I feel is there's just an immense amount of luck involved. You've got to yeah, yeah. not only be lucky, to, you know, with, with who you are and what your personality is and your work ethic, all of that is luck. You've got to have luck with the people in your life that help you get somewhere amazing. You've got to have luck that someone online finds or strikes a chord yeah, with yeah. what you're doing. I mean, there's so many elements of luck. That the algorithm just, is on your side. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that, that you get a playlist or that you get some right. algorithm to like you. So at the end of the day, a lot of this is luck. A lot of this is being as determined as you can and beefing up your percentage chance. You know, what's the percentage points that you make it? What's the probability that you end mm-hmm. up breaking through and making it? You can increase that, you know, as much as you can. But the yeah, truth is yeah. you got to get lucky and you got to have people pulling and helping you, you know? Right, um, right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining the show today. Before we get out of here, three people that you would like to see on this podcast after you. Um, let's see. Who would I like to see on the pod? I think I, I would just recommend I don't have anyone specific in mind. I would say just target I would talk to more artists. You know, I like a lot of the podcasts I'm seeing and and they're great. I'm glad I'm glad music world and there's more people doing podcasts now. I think it's I think hearing from the artist directly would do a lot of good for other artists. So many of these conversations are valuable because we need to make more connections, more bridges for artists to see how other artists are doing things. Yep. So that that's, that's the whole I mission of this podcast. So I love that. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm here to be to be part of that. And I really hope I see more and more artists jumping yeah. on. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing your energy today and bringing your your high spirits. And thank yeah. you so much for for being patient with me too earlier. Oh, um, no, dude, but, you're welcome. Thanks yeah, for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. It's been a fun conversation. We'll do more for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, everyone else who for tuning in and listening. Please make sure to like and subscribe here on YouTube and drop us a five-star review if you're listening on any of your audio streaming platforms. Have a great weekend, everyone.